Welcome to another counter-hegemonic chat. And today, Jay and I have Mia Shuha, who's a graduate, an honours graduate at Sydney University. And her thesis was specifically about Armenian Azerbaijan. She spent time in uh, the Caucasus and she's in several parts of the Caucasus. And she's just come back to us from the Middle East and uh, she studied in some depth. So we're going to take this uh, opportunity to ask Mia about uh, and to explain something about the background to the conflict that seems to be going on in the South Caucasus at the moment. So welcome, Mia. Yes, hi, thank you, Tim and Jay. <laughs> now, can I just start by asking you, can you just explain to our viewers, our listeners, where exactly Armenia and Azerbaijan are on the map? And just in a potted history of where they came from historically in the last century or so. Okay, so Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan comprise the South Caucasus region. There's the North Caucasus region, which is part of Russia, and the South Caucasus, which are three uh, independent republics now, at least since the early 90s, after the post-Soviet era. Um, Georgia has um, uh, like access to the Black Sea, while Azerbaijan has access to the Caspian Sea. Uh, Armenia is a landlocked country with a closed border with Turkey. Um, Armenia also has a, a border with Georgia and Iran, but also a closed border with Azerbaijan. So, yeah. And then, obviously, Georgia has its border to the north with uh, Russia, and Azerbaijan shares a border with Georgia to the north and Iran to the south. Now, and, what was uh, the, yeah. sorry, what was the, um, can you just explain briefly, what was the status of those two now new states within the old Soviet Union? The, which two states, sorry, Armenia, Armenia and, Azerbaijan. and Azerbaijan. Okay, so yeah, Armenia and Azerbaijan had their own um, like independent uh, republics with well, their own independent areas within the Soviet Union. And Nagorno-Karabakh had its own uh, independent oblast as well within Azerbaijan's territory. Um, I'll explain that further as we go along. But um, Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan were ruled by uh, Persia, the Persian Empire, until 1813 when Imperial Russia took over and, um, yeah, and can continue to rule those three states. But, um, yeah, it was a different system. It was a different kind of, like, rulership over them. Um, they only became independent, distinct states in around um, 1918. That was the first time that the three of them existed as independent states. So, yeah. <laughs> But independent states within that federation, the, the Soviet Federation. No, no, they each declared their distinct their independence in 1918. But then that it was kind of irrelevant because they all three of them got um, kind of absorbed into the Soviet Union. That was like the first and the first time that they ever declared independence. It was a short-lived uh, part of their histories. That first independence in 1918, and, and then now, they, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so I was just going to say, then each of them declared independence again after the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, as you say, um, there's been a reconfiguration in that whole region. Can mm. you just explain briefly, or include Georgia, I suppose, for the sake of completeness there, um, mm. what sort of spheres of influence those, let's say, those three states, three new states, um, ran into? Because we know that Georgia has ended up with significant conflict with Russia, for example. What's yes. the situation with Armenia and Azerbaijan in terms of the uh, the spheres of or the geopolitics of that region? Well, um, in 1988, when the Soviet Union was about to kind of like collapse, um, Nakhono Karabakh, like the Armenian population there, actually voted to secede from Azerbaijan and join Armenia. Um, it, it's like part of their self determination as the as the um, demographic majority in that in that piece of land. Um, that led to like a further escalation. Armenia took advantage of Azerbaijan's political infighting and declared a war, and that became the Nagorno Karabakh War of 1994. Um, so Armenia basically um, rallied all of their efforts into like taking over Nagorno Karabakh because it was land that they had contested for for the past seventy odd years. You know, they they had they never wanted it to be allocated to Azerbaijan. And so by 1994, Armenia was technically occupying 14% of Azerbaijan as stipulated by the borders at independence. And um, 
Azerbaijan responded by blockading Armenia on its eastern border. Meanwhile, Georgia has its own like um, territorial claims to Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which they f they are battling over um, with uh, Russia. Russia. So basically, Russia supports the populations of Azerbaijan and, and um, oh, sorry of uh, um, uh, sorry Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and those uh, populations um, apparently. Um, prefer to have Russia rule over them than Georgia, but that's debatable. Like the Georgian perspective differs on that. Some of the states, it's a similar thing. Some of the states allied to Russia or close to Russia recognise those two um, small areas as separate nations these days, don't they? I think yes. a handful of countries. Yeah, a handful. Yeah, it's very politically based. You know, who yes. agrees mm -hmm. to agree? But the comp uh, the thing I'm trying, the picture I'm trying to complete there, if you'll help us with this, is that mm -hmm. now you have. And, uh, and Azerbaijan, which is has some political links to Turkey. Yes. And you have an Armenia, which has historically poor relations with Turkey. Can you just explain that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it all kind of is rooted in the period uh, around the First World War, where um, like um, Armenia was kind of, well, the whole South Caucasus became like an arena for shows of power between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. Both of them were desperate empires. They were both in decline. And so it became kind of a desperate situation and a land grab within that region. So um, it's it like it was yeah it's basically since 1917 the ottoman empire was attempting to consolidate their grasp of the land in the east and they battled with the russians for control of the region but when the russian empire folded various um governing bodies were created to represent the south caucasus on a, on a government level and these different um groups like they made agreements to treaties that were not agreed to by the population in the region for example the 1918 treaty of um, brest litovsk um, saw the end of the russian involvement in the war but it also ceded control of land to the ottomans um, including Kars and batumi so then um Armenia, Azerbaijan and, uh, and Georgia rejected these treaties and established a joint Transcaucasian um, Democratic Republic. But then and then it went to war with the Ottomans, but it ultimately couldn't kind of like um, compete with the Ottoman, like like Ottoman Imperial like, em like Empire and its forces. Mm -hmm. So then the um, that federation also fell through. And in, in um, 1918, Georgia was the first state to in declare its independence, followed by Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, yeah, and in this context, um, Armenia was relatively like on its own. I mean, Georgia had turned to Germany to protect it, and um, Azerbaijan just allied itself with the Ottomans because there were no other great forces there for them to ally themselves with. And so that's kind of the beginning of Azerbaijan's al um, alliance with the Ottoman Empire, or with, like with the Turkish kind of extension now of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so, um, yeah. So, Jay, did you want to ask some more about the, the background, the historical background there before we get to the contemporary situation? <clears throat> well, we were going to uh, um, uh, talk about the, um, the reason why Armenia um, the reason Armenia doesn't have control over Nagorno-Karabakh mm -hmm. um, and how it, it came down to the to the bad uh, borders that were drawn by the Soviet Union. But mm -hmm. of course, that's a very difficult question to get into. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was uh, 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 more I, interested. I, I can yeah. comment on it, but I, I think it's a very superficial level because I don't really know Stalin's kind of internal dialogue mm -hmm. as, as to why he did it. But yeah. If you want, I can just comment on that briefly. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, re the reason why I bring it up is because the, I, I've always scratched my head about it, right? I think, mm -hmm. well, Stalin, he himself is, uh, is a Caucasian. He's, you know, Georgian. That's his mother tongue. Surely he'd understand that the region of Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenian. So there mm -hmm. must have been some kind of a, a, a political reason why those territories ended up with Azerbaijan instead. I mean, mm -hmm. they ended up getting autonomy within Azerbaijan, but that's like a kind of compromise. Um, so the the argument that I've heard from a lot of Armenians is basically that the Soviet Union, the Soviet leadership at that time, they were worried about uh, about Turkish 
um, incursions or Turkish designs on the Caucasus, mm -hmm. because the way the Turks see it, you know, um, they would they would like to expand eastwards as well, so that they don't feel like they're kind of blockaded and and cut off from the rest of Central Asia. Yes. So I think there's there's probably that kind of a geostrategic compromise going on, mm -hmm. but um, that's something that I guess we'd have to look into further. Yeah. Um, basically, yeah, um, uh, like Nakhono Karabakh and the territory of Nahechivan, which is, is separated from Azerbaijan, those two territories were both assigned to Azerbaijan by Stalin. And it's said that this was to appease Turkey and persuade them to join the USSR as an ally against Western powers. It was like maybe part of a long game, like a long strategic game. And maybe if it happened, like if Turkey wasn't a factor, that that would never have happened. Like uh, Stalin would never have made that decision. That's what yeah. it's been. That's what's been said. But that's like as as far as I can decipher as to why he did it. Yeah, that's basically. It. And my, I think my it's own relatively about, superficial. Yeah. yeah, my own kind of reading of the situation is that if you look at um, uh, pre-Bolshevik Russia, so mm -hmm. Imperial Russia, they always defined themselves as the protectors of the Eastern Christians mm -hmm. and. For centuries, the main geopolitical rival of Russia was Turkey, beginning with, um, you know, Ivan the Terrible, right, when he when he took Astrakhan uh, on the Caspian Sea. Right. Um, and so ever since then, you know, Russia's defined itself as as this uh, as this country that wants to eventually liberate Constantinople from the Turks. It has a very Christian identity, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but then what happens is that uh, the Bolsheviks come to power. And I think there's an acceptance that the Soviet Union has to become more of a multicultural state, that it has to accommodate all minorities. And so mm -hmm. it loses its historical kind of reason for existence, right, which is protector of Christians, strong Christian identity. And that's when it starts to become more pro-Turkish, right, in the sense of aligning its geo, balancing its geopolitical priorities a little bit more. Yeah. Um, any any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, definitely. Like in the past 30 years, Russia has really evolved in terms of its relations with both Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, in recent years, Russia has been like um, selling like weaponry to Azerbaijan and Armenia. Mm. And like they've even incurred a lot of backlash from Armenians that say like you're, you're, fu you're fueling the fire here, like, mm. you know, funding both of us. But I think ultimately Russia is just trying to kind of to give this um, give this view of uh, impartiality in the region. Like at the same time, Russia has like a military deal, like a military pact with Armenia. They have a, a military base in Armenia. That's like their only one in the South Caucasus, basically, because obviously they don't have any real like je like good ties with Georgia and Azerbaijan. They've just been selling weaponry. I don't think that they're actually yeah. occupied. Like they have a place there. Plus, there are five thousand, roughly five thousand troops, uh, Russian troops stationed in Armenia. So, like you know. Practically speaking, you'd assume that they'd be there to defend the country, but like everyone's too um, pessimistic to say that. <laughs> like, Armenians. It seems often like their say, hands are tied. You know yeah. that they they're trying to they're trying to serve uh, two different foreign policy objectives, right? Mm -hmm. And then without weighing down on one of them. And this has like been the biggest uh, the the biggest dilemma for the for the Soviet Union and later Russia, because if you look at it from the Soviet point of view, mm -hmm. they're trying to be. They're trying to accommodate pan-Turkic nationalism in the region, right? They're they're yeah. siding with Turkey geopolitically, of course, and uh, and what ends up happening? Turkey ends up inviting in NATO to put nuclear missiles on its soil, pointed in the direction of Moscow. So that didn't yeah. work out very well for Russia. <laughs> yeah, and and it's like it's a shame because even throughout the Soviet era, Armenians tried to partition Moscow to have like their genocide, like if begin like the nine the nineteen fifteen Armenian genocide recognized, or uh, to have the the land returned to Armenia, Nagorno Karabakh. But like that was kind of viewed as a nationalist rhetoric and mm -hmm. denounced. You know, like it's not helpful for the Soviet cause to be that to be nationalist to be like you know putting forward your case as as yeah. like armenians yeah. so it's a, it's a shame because like i think they had a legitimate kind of case <laughs> oh of <laughs> but course <laughs> it was like, viewed as nationalism and just unhelpful you know just yeah. not yeah now can we Washed, can we basically. shift the discussion now one mm -hmm. by one we've been talking about the the region i wonder if we can deal with azerbaijan 
by itself to start with and then move back to Armenia. But you just you just reminded me I was in Isfahan in, in Iran about three years ago mm-hmm. at the Museum of the Armenian Genocide. So Iran and to the south yeah. uh, and with borders with Azerbaijan uh, recognises the Armenian Genocide. And indeed, there's significant Armenian population in, uh, in Isfahan and, and in Iran. Mm-hmm. But if we look at uh, Azerbaijan, also it has this important... Um, economic links as a, 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 I suppose, um, a middle player between Iran and Russia, between two big neighbours, basically, and yes. side of a big uh, oil oil or gas pipeline, I believe. Um, can you and can you tell us something about the relations that Azerbaijan has with Iran and some of the historical features of that? Yeah, sure. So, um Azerbaijan, in, uh, since 1991, Azerbaijan has had a petro-state developmental model, very distinct from any other post-Soviet experience because of their immense oil and, and gas um, resources. So um, this has created a concentration of power and even uh, created some uneven development in the region. So um, Azerbaijan, they initially turned to the US and Turkey in the 1990s to secure their interests in economic prosperity and to maintain their territorial integrity because of what had happened with Armenia, like Armenia's like, you know, occupation or their reclaiming of Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, so yeah, this is um, like, this is, it kind of creates this um, early kind of alliance between Azerbaijan and the US. And then the U.S. kind of um, cr- like promoted Azerbaijan's alliance with Turkey and with Israel. And this is arguably for a geostrategic purpose to kind of position Israel north of Iran for strategic like reasons to have to like give them a kind of influence north of Iran. Um, so, yeah, the um, like mainly the, the main reason why um, like Iran and Azerbaijan have been on like savory terms is because Iran actually supported Armenia in the 1994 war because they also saw like Azerbaijan as a potential challenger in the region. So they decided to um, back Armenia in that war to kind of stifle the um, the power of Azerbaijan. And are that's there, why are there are links between Iran and Azerbaijan, economic, strong economic links. Yeah, that came later there's on. a province yeah. of Azerbaijan in, in Iran too. Yeah, there's a large Azeri population in northern Iran. And so it kind of cuts, like the border kind of cuts the population and has some, but there's never been any kind of, it, it's not like Nagorno-Karabakh. There's never been like claims to statehood there or like, claim, like you know, attempts to secede. Yeah. Well, this is what uh, Russia and Iran have in common because they both have Armenian and Azerbaijani populations within their borders. Mm-hmm. Like the supreme leader of Iran is Azeri. Yeah. Background, of course. But the, the, the pipeline between Iran and Russia through Azerbaijan, this is uh, a contradiction or a tension with uh, the US um, uh, Israeli ambitions you were mentioning. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, there are the main pipelines, they go from Azerbaijan through Georgia and into Turkey and Europe. And this has been like the stated intention of like the US and 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 Turkey, they they don't want to give enough. They they don't want to supply energy and um, like oil and like gas south or north to Russia. They'd prefer to have it concentrated to um, concentrated towards their European markets. So yeah, that is a contradiction. But I think that in but recent I meant, years, I meant the pipeline that's planned from Iran to Russia between yeah, Iran and Russia through Azerbaijan. It is a contradiction. So yeah, it's like in recent years. Um, uh, Azerbaijan, they need to diversify their um, like economic, like their sources of economic wealth. So I think that they're trying to have better industrial ties with Azerbaijan, and that may be part of like negotiations between Azerbaijan and Iran. Initially, they they didn't have the best relations, um, Iran and Azerbaijan. So this has come this has come up more recently as uh, Azerbaijan is trying to look elsewhere for um, yeah. Now, um, I, I think, um, you know, any economic strategy based on oil is uh, almost doomed to be a failure. I think Jay has made some points about this. Jay, that the issue of, um, you know, a strategy based on oil, you, you made some points earlier about this. You yeah, to- um, well, the what I've noticed is that if you look at the uh, the, the income levels, right, of the, the Caucasus region, 
Um, from around 2005 onwards, um, uh, Azerbaijan's GDP, per capita GDP, shoots right up because because of the invasion of Iraq, the oil mm -hmm. prices go through the roof. Azerbaijan all of a sudden becomes much wealthier than its neighbors because it has the oil. Mm -hmm. um, but then from 2014 onwards, oil prices start falling, right? I mean, largely because of, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia is, 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 uh, is, uh, overproducing in order to dr drive down prices, in order mm. to undermine Iran, undermine Russia. ISIS is is, uh, is stealing a lot of oil and selling it at discount rates as well. So this drives down oil prices. Mm -hmm. And so now Azerbaijan has roughly the same per capita GDP as its, uh, as its Caucasian neighbors. So yeah. I think maybe what happens in, in situations like this is that as oil prices rise, expectations of the populations also start to rise as well. Mm. And so when yeah. the political establishment realizes that they can't really contain the ambitions of their population, they have to search for distractions, uh, sometimes even starting wars, engaging in nationalist myth-making um, in order to distract attention away from actual working class concerns. So mm. that's perhaps one way of looking at it. Yeah, this has even been said before. It's like, when will the next Azerbaijani, like, uh, the next nagorno karabakh conflict start? And people just say, oh, when the oil prices drop in Azerbaijan, mm. you know, like yeah. it's common saying. But yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, um, yeah, it was a pretty distinct drop. I mean, when Azerbaijan declared independence in the 90s, their oil production was actually like 3% of the Soviet Union, like it, it was really, really minuscule. And that was because um, during um, like World War II, um, like the South Caucasus was threatened with invasion by the like German forces. And so actually the decision was made to shift oil production elsewhere from Azerbaijan for that reason, in case that in case they actually made headway and managed to mm. invade South Caucasus. So by the time the Soviet Union fell, um, as Azerbaijan's oil production was relatively minuscule. And then it was through funding, like their attempts at post-Soviet transition that they like, you know, radicalized their, uh, their energy industry. Um, and that was done for potential revenues and also for the, um, to kind of like give, like um, as I quoted in my article, to give um, Western powers a stake in Azerbaijan's statehood because they had this massive asset in the Caspian and that would allow them to source oil from somewhere other than like uh, Iraq or like other places in the Middle East. It gave them another option north. So it became like a huge asset for them geopolitically. Yeah, yeah Mira, I have, I have one more question about Azerbaijan before we move to Armenia, because I think there's sure. a lot to be said about Armenia. But mm -hmm. um, is there some reason why Azerbaijan culturally, historically, is seems to be uh, staying within the Turkish orbit rather than Iran? I mean, they're all Islamic countries, basically, and mm -hmm. Turkey has become more Islamic than secular in, in recent years, of course. But um, now, for example, Turkey backs Azerbaijan in this conflict with Armenia. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there's this um, and, and Turkey doesn't have a contiguous border with Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. but Iran does. And Iran mm -hmm. has a um, Azeri population, too. So what, what are the cultural sort of uh, determinants, if you like, of the fact that Azerbaijan has these closer relationships with Turkey than Iran? Yeah, well, it's based on like a street, like a strain of nationalism surrounding like uh, Turkish Brotherhood. I think that's like or Turkic Brotherhood because um, they're not they don't share a common religion and like maybe the cultures can be quite similar, but it's mostly based on like this um, like Grey Wolves nationalist movement, like sourced in Erdogan's Turkey. Like you would see there are protesters all over the place right now, Azuri protesters in, say, like in different places in the U.S. who are holding up the grey wolf symbol at, this, um, this symbol. Like, yes, yeah, like <laughs> yeah. Um, at rallies where there's like counter protests with Armenians. But um, yeah, that's uh, the nar nationalist narrative on the ground. Um, Azerbaijan is determined to kind of isolate Armenia and prevent it from getting access to its resources. So mm. they've done this by um, committing to like uh, pipeline agreements that take the oil and gas from Azerbaijan through Georgia to Turkey. So this is why um, Azerbaijan is using Turkey's willingness to uh, export their oil resources in order to intensify their isolation policy like towards 
uh, Armenia. So, like for example, um, most recently in uh, 2000, in October 2017, the new Trans Anatolian Natural Gas Pipeline um, was like was declared. Um, it was it's funded by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development to the tune of 500 million US dollars. And um, it's, an, it's a natural gas, uh, it supplies natural gas to Western Europe via Turkey. Um, at the same time, they openly declared that this is another way of keeping Armenia isolated while they exploit their wealth, as long as it continues to occupy Nagorno-Karabakh. Mm -hmm. So um, Turkey is like a direct facilitator of this policy. And they have massive stakes in, that, in, those, um, in those projects. Yeah, it would be good if uh, Armenia could have one of these pipelines running through its territory, but instead the pipelines just loop around Armenia. It's like it goes yeah. from Azerbaijan, then it traverses Georgia, then it loops back into Turkey, completely bypasses Armenia, which isn't which isn't really in the picture. Yeah. Um, so let's, and, let's, let's talk yeah. about Armenia then. Um, can you give yeah. us a bit of a, a, a potted history of where Armenia sits in the region in terms of its geostrategic relations? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, Armenia is pretty limited in terms of, you know, like um, leverage that they have in the region. They're landlocked. And I, I think partly or well, some Armenians believe part of the reason they've been able to survive is through their occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh, because without it, there's a tiny little corridor between Azerbaijan and, and Turkey, or like, like Azerbaijan and Nahachivan, really. Like, you know, that wouldn't really, they, they say it's not like feasible to maintain like their, you know, territorial integrity with that little amount of land. I mean, that's what they say. They say that like Nakono Karapak has been vital to like, you know, their statehood because of um, their limited resources and their lack of access to the sea. So at the moment, um, Azerbe like Armenia is landlocked from um, the east and the west with Turkey and Azerbaijan, and their trading partners consist of Iran, uh, Georgia, and Russia. Russia is like the largest trading partner in the region. But I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's landlocked, but it has these much more extensive international and expat communities, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, they're huge uh, diaspora in, communities. Contradictory in some in some ways too. What are the what are the you say Russia's the biggest trading partner? What about Iran? What about the U.S.? Um, so Iran has actually um, increased their trade with Armenia last year and is become and is strengthening their ties with Armenia. This has even seen Armenia, they, they held the uh, Eurasian Economic Union talks last year, which consist of Russia and Kazakhstan, Belarus, uh, other um, post-Soviet states. Um, they, yeah, so Armenia hosted these talks and they invited Iran to join them. So this is, and they, you know, there was like, you know, selfies posted online between the leaders of the states. This is kind of a show that Armenia is willing to aid Iran in their like sanctions and ongoing hostilities from the US because of the, you know, it, it happened last year of all the years. It's a relatively new development. I so it's helped Syria too. They've sent sappers yeah. to deep mine some parts of northern Syria too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so um, this is a problem um, between Armenia and the US. Um, Armenia and the US, they have trade agreements and they receive high amounts of, like uh, Armenia receives high amounts of aid and NGO interest. Um, Armenia has also developed strong civil movements in recent years um, based on like um, American like exported um, principles such as democracy and free trade and stuff. Um, however, the government under Pashinyan has also had to um, pursue a policy of Armenia centrism, and this leads to them aligning with Iran and Russia when it comes to real geop geopolitical issues, material issues uh, in the region. Um, this has seen Armenia like align itself with Iran and also with, um, with Russia through their um, sending of support to Syria. So all of this has kind of put them in a bad light with the U.S. recently. Um, Pashinyan, he also went to New York to a U.N. General Assembly last year, and he was making comments about democracy, saying that on, along the lines of countries have a right to choose their own democracy rather than exporting uh, a form of democracy from the U.S., so mm. his more recent comments have contradicted what people said that he would kind of align Armenia more with with the U.S. 
So yeah, it's like the geo geopolitical necessities at hand have directed Pashinyan's outlook and brought him closer to Iran and Russia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems like there's um, there's uh, um, like a concerted effort by quite a few countries to 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 back Azerbaijan in this, right? Mm -hmm. And one country that stands out for me is Israel. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, that. Uh, Armenia actually showcased downed Israeli-made drones that were utilized by the by the Azerbaijani forces. Could you tell us a little bit about the relationship between Israel and Azerbaijan? Why is there such a strong strategic partnership? I mean, these two countries, um, mm. I, it, there's no obvious reason why they'd be friends, and yet they are. Mm. Um, well, after the fall, like I keep referring back to like the fall of the so, Soviet Union because it kind of conflict, it yeah. un, un, like, unlocked all of these crazy new trends in you know like geopolitical alliances. But yeah, I think that as like Israel sought to align itself with these newly independent countries, and one of them was Azerbaijan, what the one that had the most oil wealth. Perhaps like it had the most to gain from an alliance with Azerbaijan, especially because of their proximity to Iran. So they, like the Caspian became a major interest in U.S. foreign policy. And um, it was like, uh, uh, yeah, it was an important location. And the U.S. initially imposed this external kind of military alliance between Turkey and Azerbaijan and Israel um, to put the countries at odds with Iran. Mm. Um this alliance benefited uh, Azerbaijan because um, there was a, a like an act put forward in um, in the U.S. the Freedom Support Act from 1992, and it was made to limit U.S. aid to Azer Azerbaijan because of their blockade blockade of Armenia. Um, in 1999, the um, coalition of Jewish organizations began kind of campaigning Washington to um, support like a Silk Road bill uh, legislation, which would allow uh, Israel and the US to have more influence in the future developments in the Caucasus and Central Asian republics. So um, the US and Israel, they, they, they stood to reap enormous amounts of um, like revenue through investing in pipelines um, in these lands and connecting them to Turkey. Once again, it comes back to the like uh, to the pipeline agreements mm. between Azerbaijan and Turkey. Um, this would also uh, reduce the independence on Persian Gulf oil, and it would benefit both both of the countries' national security interests. And yeah, it would and yeah, uh, Israel also enjoyed uh, their own strategic and economic relationship with Turkey. Um, this would like allow them to solidify their relationship and also develop more relations with moderate Muslim governments um, that were wary of Iranian and Russian uh, ambitions. It's so, all a little counterintuitive, isn't it, in, in hmm. Western terms, because Armenia, a pocket of Christian culture, yeah. um, with very strong diaspora in Western countries, mm -hmm. finds itself aligned more with Iran, Syria, and Russia than the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, moreover, you know, Jay, you mentioned that these pipelines purposefully kind of avoid Armenia. Um, yeah, that was also impacted by APAC, uh, the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee, and they were the ones that pushed for the creation of this um, energy corridor that included Baku, Tbilisi, and Jehan. Um, mm, yeah, mm. that was, and that also that that excludes Armenia. So yeah, yeah currently, I, um, yeah, yeah, they they currently like Azerbaijan delivers thirty percent of oil to the Azeri, uh, to the Israeli market, and um, high level officials in both countries have discussed like the the um, development of um, Israel Israel's own prospects for developing gas gas fields. So yeah. it just it's just a tr like a very um, convenient kind of al al uh, allegiance for both of them. I guess maybe Israel also consumes uh, a lot of Armenian oil as well. I'm sorry, not Azerbaijani oil as well, <laughs> because if it's going to Jehan, then it's uh, it's just it's on the Mediterranean. It can easily be shipped to to Israel. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and um, yeah. More recently, it developed into a, a military kind of um, alliance. Lots of weapons being sold um, to Azerbaijan by Israel, and that's mm. where. The drones popping up in the recent clash in Tavush is like significant because yeah. you can see the direct like fallout of that policy.
Mia, you mentioned this NGO industry in, in Armenia, and I'm still struck by, I'm going back to this thing about culturally there are these links, you know, with in Christian culture and with the, the, the expats in the US and other Western countries from Armenia. Is there some sort of, but you can see all the practical reasons why Armenia would be having much stronger commercial relationships with its neighbours um, in the region and the historical links in the region. Is there some sort of split between the expat Armenian community and the, the real Armenian economy itself or the, the real politic of Armenia itself? Yeah, um, actually, you could make the argument because there's such a large diaspora community, the real ties between Armenia and, uh, and the US and Russia, they, they uh, are forged through the diaspora community's incremental economic flows that like um, that come to form a greater economic and ideological picture overall. This is kind. Of, this is aside from any policy or um, any official agreements between the countries. It's more like the flow of capital and like the flow of kind of ideas, ideo ideological ideas between these these three groups that kind of creates a tension within Armenia. Um, yeah, like the, the spatiality of the South Caucasus uh, adds another element of complexity, definitely. Um, yeah, both Azerbaijan and Armenia have large diaspora populations overseas, and this is higher for Armenia. Um, Armenia, like their population is roughly 3 million now, um, and this is the result of many years of migration ever since 1991. The largest Armenian uh, population is in Russia with uh, 1.2 1 million Armenians, mm. followed by the US. It's around 500,000. Um, yeah, remittances play another role. So uh, remittances from abroad constituted 12% of GDP in 2018, and 60% of, the, of these remittances were from Armenians working in Russia. Um, yeah, this is kind of, it really further entrenches Armenia's uh, economic dependence on Russia. So the, um, the, the biggest community, expat communities in Russia, there are yes. significant Armenian populations, of course, in in uh, Iran and Iraq and, and yes. Syria and Lebanon mm -hmm. as well in the region. Um, regionally, what, what's the size of those expat communities? In Iran, or I'm Armenian actually, sorry? Or Armenian communities in the region? In the region? Well, um, I'm not actually sure of the population number in Syria and Iran at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've kind of like focused my analysis on the tension between um, like US ideals and US like notions of like democracy and liberty compared with the material benefit of Armenia's uh, like um, kind of um, relationship with Russia. It's like this tension between ideas that are steering the country and then the actual economic benefit received from Russia and how it plays out in politics or like at least in the um, kind of like understanding of Armenians living there, like the way that they see their country and their future. Now, the other big factor here is, of course, the whole Eurasian uh, system, getting beyond the, the South Caucasus um, yeah. uh, and the role of China. And China's got these new big agreements with Pakistan, big yes. agreement with Iran, mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole big infrastructural project. Um, how do you see the, the role of China or rather the response of the South Caucasus to mm -hmm. that, um, those new developments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, China has already provided quite a bit of aid to Armenia. I don't have a specific figure, but like even now, like the main forms of transport in Yerevan, like um, above ground, like the, the buses that go through town are all donate were all donated by China aid, as even said on the on the side of them. I guess that with China's kind of recent um, like um, agreements with Iran, this could translate into further agreements with Armenia, especially because um, like Iran seems to be willing to um, involve itself in the Eurasian Union. They may also kind of create more opportunities for economic integration with China as well, especially because of like, you know, the Eurasian Union wanting to um, get more members from Central Asia. They already have Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. They want to increase that. So they might also spill over into um, like um, collaborations with China economically. And what about the Azeris? 
the Azuris. Um, I think re the most recent changes have been their um, ties with Iran. I think that they, they've kept it local <laughs> relatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have their massive oil revenues, not as much now, but yeah, this is still quite helpful. And they, they're looking at creating an industrial zone, a joint industrial zone with Iran on, on their shared border. Mm. Mm -hmm. Jay, comments on the Eurasian influence on the South Caucasus? Yeah, um, I hope uh, I hope it can go to to some way to to um, to supporting the rights of Armenians to self determination in Artsakh, uh, because it's it's such a glaringly obvious um, case of uh, case of a population that is historically indigenous to that land. Ninety nine percent of the population of that. Uh, of that region, of that Artsakh region, Nagorno-Karabakh, are Armenians, right? And yet, it's it's in the it's in a different country altogether. So, I guess my question, um, because I'm not too sure how Armenia is integrating with the rest of Eurasia, but is there any sympathy from other Eurasian players for the for the cause of Artsakh, or is it or is it completely on the side of or are the rest of or is the rest of Eurasia completely on the side of Azerbaijan in this conflict? Um, well, as I mentioned before, Azerbaijan kind of create, like they um, became another like superpower almost in the region. They hold a lot of leverage. Um, mm. Georgia, for example, you kind of would expect Georgia to align itself with Armenia based on their common like, Christian values. Yeah. But they, they also have some tensions, like Georgia and Armenia have a history of like uh, fighting over different religious sites amongst their borders. But um, yeah, like recently, I mean, Georgia is not in a position to kind of like step out of line and criticize Azerbaijan because they're receiving oil and um, they're much poorer than mm -hmm. Azerbaijan. Um, but at the same time, there were recent accusations that Georgia had helped to um, transport weapons from Serbia to Armenia. Like, you know, it's kind of covert, is these little ties that you can't really, it's very difficult to have a full grasp of the relations there. But yeah, like um, apparently there was some covert kind of like, you know, supplying of weapons via um, Georgia from Serbia. I haven't heard of any other country though, like uh, involving itself in this mm. conflict. That's like, it seems uh, like a tough neighborhood, right? Because yeah. <laughs> you've got the Stans, right? And they're mm. all Turkic. And yes. so my instinct is to think, well, they're going to be siding with Azerbaijan and Turkey on this issue. Mm -hmm. So how many friends does Armenia have? They have the diaspora. Mm -hmm. They have Serge Tankian from uh, System of a Down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they have, uh, you know, Russia is kind of like a 50-50, uh, is, is, you know, hedging its bet, bets both ways on this issue. You forgot the Kardashians, Jane. Yeah, They've got the Kardashians. Kardashians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what about this... Um, the Armenian press on this recent conflict um, blames uh, Azerbaijan, you know, for starting it, even though apparently Azerbaijan took all the first casualties and the Armenians didn't. Um, yeah. Have you got any particular insight into, uh, you sort of suggest that the Azeris started it because maybe it was linked to the, the crash in oil prices or something like that, but like, is there any real indication? A lot of the reports say it's rather mysterious how the, the recent conflict began. Yeah, so, um, the thing is, I just, I think maybe it's not just me, but I, I kind of struggle to understand why Armenia would engage Azerbaijan now at this time when they have one of the highest rates of uh, COVID infections per capita in the world. I mean, it's just not the most opportunistic time for Armenia to be like, you know, setting a standard or making a statement or anything like that. I mean, like... Um, Azerbaijan has been accumulating weapons. They've been engaged in a little mini arms race, like with like um, Israel, ever since at, at least 2010. Um, there have also been threats made occasionally throughout the years to reclaim the land. Um, like reference has also been made to like rec reclaiming land that was historically Azerbaijani. Um, mm. There have al also been skirmishes intermittently, like throughout the years. Um, on a smaller scale, nothing since nothing like this month or since 2016, the last clash. But like, still, there've been small like skirmishes. Um, yeah, and like, there's this constant strong nationalist rhetoric 
put forward by Azerbaijan and so Turkey. Armenia stands to benefit from the status quo from yes no yeah, my, basically. yeah and um, it's been suggested that Azerbaijan may be using Armenia's weakness now during the pandemic to start another conflict one of the first targets was a PPE mask factory in the Tabush region of all mm. the things Azerbaijan could target purely um, civilian Yes, I know there was a kindergarten attacked as well. Like yeah, Iran has a terrible second, a huge second wave of infections too at the moment. So I'm not mm. sure to what extent the Azeris are going to miss out on it. Is, are the levels much lower in Azerbaijan at the moment? Yeah, they've managed to contain it relative, like comparatively. Like when you look at the South Caucasus, Armenia has had the worst cases. Like, uh, yeah, I think it's because of like, like um, in, on an individual level, people refusing to wear masks. Like, um, I, I'm not exactly sure if there's like a trend as to why. But yeah, um, also that region, the Tabush region, um, it's the location where um, Azerbaijan has three of its oil pipelines passing through mm. the territory to Georgia. So um, it might also be like it's a valuable location for the transit of oil and gas. Um, there are three ma major oil and gas pipelines that go through there. Uh, it may also, it may be that um, Azerbaijan is trying to start a conflict by in, like coaxing Armenia into targeting that territory, you know, because it, mm. it like um, different parties in Georgia, Turkey and in Europe um, are invested in that little piece of land with those pipelines passing through it. So, mm. yeah, it could it could be that they're trying to encourage Armenia to fire into that location and to rally global strategic support for Azerbaijan's cause by threatening their resource assets. Or that's they what, could uh, be... That's been said. Hasn't, hasn't that been, like, kind of aired, that perspective, Jay? I've seen different, uh, I've seen different discussions on, on Twitter. So one of the um, uh, uh, tweets that I saw... They they point out that control of um, of of certain positions within Armenia would be very important. Um, like if if the Azerbaijanis were able to control that, then it would uh, basically prevent any kind of threat to their pipelines, right? Yeah. Um, and I think maybe the other kind of uh, consideration here, from an Azerbaijani perspective, in order to look at the, the the conflict from their point of view, is that if they were to let's say seize a piece of uh, Armenian territory militarily, mm -hmm. then they could say to Armenia, you have to demand that Nagorno-Karabakh disarms and that they they fully absorb themselves into Azerbaijan. And basically, uh, um, uh, it would mean that their, their national claims would be at the mercy of Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. which uh, brings me to, to another thing that I wanted to ask you. Um, Azerbaijan, they say that they are willing to give some degree of autonomy to Nagorno-Karabakh. Is that correct? Yes, they, they want to have it like um, included within Azerbaijan's borders, but as an independent territory equivalent to Tatarstan in Russia. Like there's a there's a kind of model for what they're what they're suggesting. But I think that um, like Armenians are not very like trusting they, mm. they like currently the population of Nakoro Karapakh is around 150,000 people with the majority being Armenians at 99 roughly 99 percent other than that they have an, a minority of Russians Ukrainians Yazidis Assyrians mm. and Georgians so it's like how how would that kind of go forward like how would the Azuris try to kind of control the dis distribution, the population distribution there, if they gained access. Also, they have a bad, like, um, like there's a bad kind of precedent. If you look at what's happened in Nahachivan, where they've had like thousands and thousands of historic Armenian monuments just destroyed, you know, mm. because yeah. like, so I think, um, you know, Armenians are not very like, you know, willing to, to trust, you know. And that, fair enough. That, I mean, when, know, Within within living memory, this is a nation that has experienced a genocide, right? Like 1.5 million. Now, if you were to um, ask the question, what would that 1.5 million look like today if they were to have kids? You know, it'd be many millions more, right? Like oh, yeah. Armenia's population, mm -hmm. like in that region, might actually be double. <laughs> yes. Which would mean that the 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 amount of territory would extend into like the Lake Van region in mm -hmm. in um in what's now Turkey. Mm -hmm. Um. And so, yeah, I mean, like, why would they settle for autonomy when their 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 demographic over that entire region has been decimated? 
Yeah, there's this historic kind of resentment, you know, like like historic hatred that kind of haunts this whole conflict. Like even just uh, from my recent experience driving through eastern Turkey, I, I went through Harput, which was like um, it used to be heavily populated by Armenians. And um, I, I came across old ruins of an Armenian church that had been kind of vandalized and dug for gold by the locals, I guess. They, there was like a, a, a like a Turkish Hezbollah flag kind of painted right. into the remains, like the the stone wall, like you, not not like uh, just to, know, just like, to be clear, Turkish Hezbollah is the is the Wahhabi. Yes, um, like, they're Wahhabis. Yeah. They've got nothing to do with the Lebanese faction. <laughs> yes, good, good yeah. on you for yeah. So it's like <laughs> Armenians don't really have any kind of you know like positive precedent to base this idea on like uh this idea for an independent non-independent which is like vast majority armenian yeah i, mean, I, mean, I, wanna, I think yes yeah, i want to head back to a to a wrap up which sort of puts a big picture question to you mm -hmm. all of the complexities and the difficulties we've been discussing mm -hmm. is this to some extent the the fruit or you know the rotten fruit of fragmentation you know fragmentation into ethnic statelets and the other side of that big picture question is, where does Eurasian integration offer some signs of hope for the region? So it's it's a big picture question. Just some of your reflections would be good. Yes. Okay. Well, that was kind of the focus of my honors thesis last year. I made the argument that the actual populations within the South Caucasus, not like the governments there, not like decision makers at the top. I mean, the actual people there stand to gain more from like regional cooperation and cohesiveness. This is like evident in, if you look at the Azuri case, they have this immense oil wealth, but they still have like, uh, you know, difficulties with their GDP per capita now, like with Azerbaijan kind of, you know, decreasing in its income per capita back to the levels of Armenia and Georgia, despite their immense oil wealth. I think that they, they could have gained more if they reinvested that wealth into kind of um, another integrated market between the three states or try to at least kind of um, take care of social provisioning for the people there. Um, meanwhile, Armenia is trying to reclaim this land that's majority Armenian at, at this great cost where they're being isolated, like violently isolated from like oil and gas resources that they had access to in the Soviet era, you know. Um, at the same time, Georgia is pursuing this course of trying to align itself with the EU and the US, but a lot of the time they go against their own interests by kind of promoting free trade and like um, reducing regulations for businesses, um, like having um, like detrimental wage standards, allowing a lot of like, um, you know, like, I don't know, red tape operations by these for like by foreign uh, corporations. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I feel like uh, Azerbaijan is like very headstrong in this um, like isolationist policy towards Armenia and it's kind of posing a, like a detriment to the region as a whole, I, I personally think. So this, this is like, if this continues, there's always going to be this threat of a breakout of war. For me, like positive, um, like any like positive developments have mostly been around like developments with Iran because this is a way in which like Azerbaijan and Armenia can both kind of engage with a neighbor in a positive way, in a constructive economic and political way, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that this issue is just going to continue as long as. Um, Azerbaijan and Armenia have this very strong nationalist kind of ideology at the helm of their decision making. Jay, some final comments on that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's also a lot of hope with China. Mm. They're the uh, upcoming superpower and um, they have issues within their own borders with, uh, with Turkic separatism, mm. Islamism. And so maybe there's, a, maybe there's the possibility of a common cause. Mm -hmm. So Eurasian integration throws open all kinds of possibilities. Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time, Mia. We appreciate that. It's a difficult uh, situation. I think um, we've all gained a bit more of a background there. Thanks again. Thank you very much, guys.